The first case to come before the court today is State of Ohio versus Howard Thomas. Each party will have 15 minutes to present its argument. The appellate may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. Um, if you do plan to reserve time, let me know when you begin your argument. I'll do my best to keep track of time for you and try to keep you apprised of the time. Arguments are being visually and audibly recorded. We will um, post it online when we're finished. Um, do not use the names of any um, witnesses or victims in this case, as best you can help it. Um, at least minors, we've read your briefs and we are ready to proceed when you are. And um, Ms. Bremke, you start off here. Yes, good morning, Your Honors. Um, Giovanna Bremke on behalf of Mr. Thomas. Um, we are here today um, on a manifest weight and sufficiency argument. Um, rebuttal time? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I would reserve five minutes of rebuttal time. Okay. Um, but the facts are um, going to be important. So normally we don't get too much into the facts, but I will in this case. Um, and uh, I, I do want to point out just at the beginning of the argument, um, you know, there was a recent case uh, that actually Brian and I both argued um, and the um, Thomas Leonard, um, Thomas in both names, although first name and last name different. Um, and I know Judge Carr was also on that panel, um, but it was a very recent case. And um, a lot of what um, the rationale in that case was, was fact dependent. So, um, and I, I obviously cite to that in my brief, um, but that's, uh, you know, why I wanted to get into a lot of these facts. So um, my client, um, received, he had um, sold a tire to an individual um, named Laura and um, she, uh, her boyfriend was going to pay him the money for the tire. So he was calling up to her asking, um, you know, about that um, money and a different individual, not the boyfriend, someone is totally different, um, in a co-defendant in this case, Ron um, Breltic, um, he answered the phone, he identified himself as Rodney, and he asked um, Mr. Thomas to come pick him up um, because he was also trying to um, get money for you know a separate uh, situation from a friend, is what he tells my client. Um, my client says, well, I'm going that way anyways, and I'm going to go, I, I'll go pick, come pick you up and help you out. So he does, he picks him up, he takes him to um, the friend's house, and this is what um, my client believed was the friend's house, and um, this individual, uh, Ron had told him, park a few houses down, um, because my friend's wife doesn't want um, you showing up, at the, doesn't want me showing up at the house. So he does, he parks a few houses down. Um, and then at some point, um, Ron comes back to the vehicle and um, gets in the car and they're stopped a couple blocks over. And, um, you know, it, it would, it, what manifests is that Ron had gone behind a shed of uh, that house and tried to break into that shed. Um, nothing was ever located in uh, the vehicle that my client and Ron were in that was linked to that shed. Um, there is talk about tools being in the vehicle, um, but I'll um, point out, if, you know, none of, there was never any testimony that um, from the individual who owned the shed or otherwise that um, those tools were used. I think it's a dangerous precedent. A lot of people, a lot of handy men carry around tools um, just to have tools in the vehicle. Um, again, none of that was ever linked um, to the shed or any criminal activity. So, uh, when counsel, oh, go ahead. I just have a question in regard to that because um, those are some of the questions I was thinking as I was reading this. And, and that is, um, did, uh, was this just a regular truck when you say handyman? I mean, is there any evidence that, that uh, your client was, you know, that he used those tools in his trade or his, you know, occupation or anything? Yeah, he did testify. And, I, you know, I, 
I guess I don't know the exact nature of the testimony, but he did testify that he regularly carried those tools around. Um, there was a lawnmower in the back, and again, there was lawnmowers in the shed, but that lawnmower was never linked to the shed. Um, and he said that he carries, those are his tools that he carries around to fix things. Um, uh, and same with the lawnmower that I believe the lawnmower had been broken down and he needed to fix it. So um, there was certainly, he testified that those were just tools he regularly carried around with him. Was um, it an actual lawnmower or just like a grass catcher? Yeah, something lawn, something lawnmower part, parts. Again, I don't think it was an operational lawnmower and they were questioning him about that. Um, and I'm going to even concede to you that um, perhaps there was enough here for probable cause. I initially, when they um, stopped him and they saw these tools and the lawnmower parts and all of that, um, you know, if we were at a preliminary hearing, I, I might say, you know, yeah, you know, there was probably something enough um, for them to charge him, but not enough to convict under, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt here. Um, because again, none of this, you know, it, while, while it may look suspicious, none of this was ever linked to the shed. Um, again, there's no testimony that any of these tools were used. Um, and, uh, you know, my client, again, it, it, when you look at this other, this Thomas Leonard case that was argued um, just several months ago in this court, um, in that case, and again, I represented that individual, but, um, you know, there was a scuffle that the, um, that the co-defendant had witnessed, um, and the, in the, the primary offender, I guess I'm going to call her, um, came running towards the vehicle, um, and they peeled out of that driveway. In this, there's none of those other case, there's none of those other factors where, um, there's no testimony um, either, you know, there, there was two police officers and um, my client who testified, and those were the only three that had testified. But there's no, no facts that say that um, Mr., uh, you know, that Ron, he, that he had come running towards the vehicle, that he said, hey, I just got caught breaking into a shed, um, we've got to go, we've got to run. Um, and, you know, again, um, and I, I made this argument in the Leonard case, there can't be a complicity after the fact. So, um, you know, even if those were the facts, I would still argue that, you know, you can't, you, it, it would be what the, what the understanding was going into it. Um, in, in this case, there's just no facts that the state presented um, that would, that would um, show what the um, intent was going into that. And, and the, what we're left with is the testimony of my client who says that, you know, this was a transaction in which um, Ron was going to collect money from his friend. He parked a few doors down and Ron got back into the car and they drove away. There was no discussion um, about, hey, get out of here. The police are coming. Um, nothing along those lines. So while um, there may have been confusion upon, um, initially, and I think that's probably why um, my client was arrested because there was some confusion, there was tools, there was this lawnmower parts. Um, and again, while I'm, I, I can see that maybe that's enough for probable cause, it's not enough to convict him beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, there was you know, nothing here that would indicate that he had solicited aided, abetted, conspired, um, or caused Ron to commit this crime. Um, in a fact, couple, when he, of, oh, go ahead. couple of questions. Number one was, I believe this was a forcible entry into the shed, wasn't it? Was it a locked shed? And if so, did anybody, was there any noise associated with it? I, I believe somebody, there was a woman who saw the, uh, Mr. Bray, Braylick at the shed. Did she see him with tools? Uh, I know that's, and the last question, so you can answer all of them. Uh, was, there <laughs> anything, was there anything unusual about the stop as far as uh, speeding, evading, et cetera? Three questions for you. Um, so um, the, I believe the woman that you're referring to is the homeowner of the, um, the, of the shed. Yes. Um, it, she did actually, she didn't testify. The only information we have to that effect is through the officers. Okay. Um, and what the officers did is they had traced back um, Mr. Braylick's footprints to um, where my client's car was parked. Um, and I believe there must have been some um, sort of 
uh, activity for her to call, but um, you know, that's, and that's why the police were involved. Um, but there's no um, testimony to my recollection that it was a loud noise, that there was booms, that um, anything along those lines. Again, my client is parked a couple doors down and this is behind the building. Um, there was certainly no testimony that it was loud enough for him to hear. Um, and, and, and I'm uh, assuming she did not see him carrying anything to the shed as, as in the form of a tool. Um, uh, no, I don't believe there was any testimony to that effect. Oh. Um, and again, there was tools found in the vehicle, but um, none of them were really linked. Um, you know, what about the stop? Um, the, the stop, I believe, was just a, there was nothing um, ordinary about the stop. Um, and uh, other than, you know, not the stop itself, but again, I would concede that there was confusion initially about why they were stopped and um, things along those lines. Um, but, and again, I would expect there to be confusion from my client because he, you know, wouldn't have known, um, you know, why they were being stopped um, because, you know, he had no knowledge of what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, even, and again, this goes to my um, second assignment of error, the manifest weight argument. Um, if you look Ms. on... Bremke, um, yep. Ms. Bremke, you're at your five minutes. You're okay. welcome to continue. I just want you to be apprised of your time. Sure. So if you, um, I'll just point out on page, uh, the transcript, page 96, uh, Patrolman Perkins was asked um, by the defense attorney, um, and this is a quote. So other than Mr. Thomas being in the area, what evidence do you have that Mr. Thomas knew that the purpose there, um, there was to break into sheds? And his answer is none. And I think that says everything that you need to know that, um, again, the state makes um, a, per, uh, a point in their argument to say that all Mr. Thomas used in his um, a brief was self-serving testimony, but that's not true. This this patrolman specifically mentions that there's nothing else to link him other than him being in the area um, that that he knew about the break into the shed. Um, at that point, he could have said, "Well, there's loud noises, there's tools, there's this, there's that," um, and none of that was said. So I'd reserve the rest of my time. All right. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Murphy. Once again, good morning, judges. Uh, Brian Murphy, for the record, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney, Lorain County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, the state is asking the court to affirm the uh, conviction for complicity to commit breaking and entering in this case. Uh, first, I should note for the court that this was a bench trial. I'm going to remind the court of, of that uh, fact. Uh, with a single count indictment that did charge the complicity statute under 2923-0382. The incident occurred at 3815 Washington Avenue in the city of Lorain in Lorain County. Um, Washington is a street that runs east and west, uh, I'm sorry, north and south. It, uh, it intersects with a street from the transcript you know as Tower. Um, the address of this location, I think the map shows, is, is essentially a corner, it, it, it's a corner lot where the two streets intersect. Red Hill, the last fact I'll point out, is essentially a street that runs uh, um, as an arc, connects Tower um, and, and Washington. You can almost picture it um, as a, a trivial pursuit pie piece, if I'm not dating myself on, on that <laughs> reference. The, with the first assignment of error in the sufficiency argument, uh, the state points out that Mr. Thomas essentially fails to cite to any relevant portion of the uh, record in making this argument. Um, Mr. Thomas only basically cites to his testimony portions of the transcript, um, which of course is self-serving uh, and also doesn't take the, uh, for the most part, the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. If this court does take the light most favorable, uh, evidence in a light most favorable to the state, it, it can conclude that a rational trier of fact could have concluded through circumstantial evidence uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Thomas supported, assisted, and cooperated with uh, Mr. Berlatic in carrying out this breaking and entering offense. 
um, and shared the requisite criminal intent. Again, the, you can infer those circumstances from companionship, from presence, and from conduct before and after committing the offense. Uh, for instance, driving the getaway car. Now, Mr. Thomas assisted Mr. Berletic by using his vehicle to drive Mr. Berletic to a location where the breaking and entering offense occurred and with the intention to use it to conceal and transport stolen items uh, and then to drive Mr. Berletic away. One point I'd also make is that um, the, Mr. Thomas doesn't raise an issue as to whether a breaking and entering occurred. So it's, uh, I think, conceded and presumed that a breaking and entering offense did occur. Um, and therefore, we're only left with the complicity aspect of this case. Now, how can we infer that Mr. Berletic, uh, or I'm sorry, that Mr. Thomas uh, supported, assisted, or cooperated with uh, Mr. Berletic? Well, let's look at the size of the shed. Mr. Berletic broke into a shed, and this is from Joint Exhibit 2 at the 1141.44 mark. So 1141 and 44 seconds p.m. Uh, from one of the body cams. The shed was large enough to hold a commercial snowblower and a big riding lawnmower, is how it's described by one of the officers. Um, we can infer that Mr. Berletic intended to steal something because there was no other reasonable explanation for him being there. No theft offense is required also. Breaking and entering only requires with the intention to commit a theft offense uh, under the charge section. Uh, so the fact that no items were stolen isn't necessarily um, decisive of the issue. Now, counsel, re counsel, remind me, were locks cut? Yes, Judge. Two locking mechanisms were broken, um, which I'll, uh, I'll get to in a moment, Judge. Um, well, the only reason I'm asking that is because, back to Judge Tudosio's question about uh, the homeowner, and I understand the homeowner didn't testify, but did the uh, police officer mention um, she heard a loud noise or something? She heard noise in the backyard? I, I don't think the record's clear on that. Uh, fact okay, judge. and then on top of that, did she say anything about seeing anything in the individual's hands, any tools or anything? No, Judge, I don't believe the record reflects that either. Okay. Thank you. So the, he, he what we can also infer from going into shed is he intended to steal large items, you know, not something that's going to fit in his pockets. He's not at a discount drug mart. He's not at a Rite Aid. He's not stealing soap or, or, or toothpaste or a toothbrush in this case. He's intending to steal large items. So we can infer from that he needed a way, Mr. Berletti, to, to conceal and transport these items after stealing them. Um, he would have needed a plan to do that. Uh, so he needed someone with a vehicle to come along with him. So he arranged for Mr. Thomas to transport him to the area with the understanding of what Mr. Berletic intended to do. Now, we, we can infer that because the, the story that Mr. Thomas told police during the traffic stop just doesn't make sense. And that's how we infer the, the knowledge of the, of the plan ahead of time. Mr. Thomas, were there in, when the tools, when they stopped them and they saw the tools, were the tools in a, just strewn about or were they in a, yeah. a, a, like a designated area? Yes, Judge. They were on the, uh, the passenger side floorboard uh, is how I recall the record describing where the tools were. And nobody took any fingerprints of the tools? No, Judge. Not that I'm, the record doesn't reflect that. Now, Tom, uh, Thomas is wearing coveralls, uh, despite the fact that he's supposedly just driving around aimlessly, according to his own words, at about 11 o'clock at night. No plausible explanation for why he's driving around. And he's pulling into driveways on Red Hill Drive. Now, let's remember, the, the shed where this occurred was not on Red Hill. The, the story Mr. Thomas ultimately tells occurs on Red Hill, but this... Uh, incident occurs essentially at the corner of Washington and Tower. So the shed, it, when when um, Ms. was talking about the shed being behind the house and 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 where Mr. Thomas was, we're conflate, we're we're 
we're combining two, two versions of events that we're combining the version that Mr. Thomas told with the version of what happened. And, and they can't both be true. Uh, they, they pull, he's pulling into a driveway, he's turning his headlights off um, without any explanation to the officers. But supposedly he just picked Mr. Berletic up who's walking around call, and then calls him for a ride. Now to believe this version of events from Mr. Thomas, you'd have to believe that Mr. Berletic was committing this offense because there, there's, that's not contested here, that Mr. Berletic committed this offense and that he was going to steal these large items and just call up somebody and believe that they were gonna come help him carry it out then, unwittingly. That doesn't make sense. Um, and it doesn't make sense that he would call a guy who knew him as Rodney and who'd only maybe uh, who met him that day. They weren't even that familiar with one another. I was confused when I was reading it because uh, that's the story he told the police officers, but then he testified to something else, right? That, Cor correct, that he Judge. had called Laura or whatever, and then this guy had asked him to take him over there. Right, Judge. Um, and what, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll address the tools quickly and I'll address the, the different stories. The, the two, so what, what Mr. Thomas says just didn't make sense. And therefore, the, the, only, the only really logical explanation, maybe, maybe the most logical, but really only logical explanation, is not confusion, as Ms. Bremke termed it, but they knew, these guys knew why they were being pulled over. Officers told them right away that there was a report of a break-in and, and, and description of people. Um, Mr. Thomas wasn't being truthful during the traffic stop. And if he wasn't being truthful, why was that? Well, the logical explanation is because he was assist assisting, cooperating with, and supporting Mr. Berletic. Um, the tools also show that, Judge. For Mr. Berletic to have broken two locking mechanisms on this shed, he had to have used tools. And within 10 minutes of the incident occurring, police find a hammer, a flashlight, and a blue tarp in Mr. Thomas's truck. All the tools belong to Mr. Thomas, by the way. There's no indication that Mr. Berletic possessed any tools or claimed any of the tools. In fact, Mr. Thomas claimed all the tools in the truck as his. There was no lawnmower in the truck either. Um, it was a grass catcher, as Judge Carr pointed out. Uh, handymen don't keep tools strewn about the, uh, the cab, as Judge Carr also had no, or in answer to Judge Carr's question. So the well, tools, let me ask you in regard to that grass catcher. I don't know how big it was or anything, and I don't know what size truck it was. How much of the bed was available for use? How much of the bed? Truck bed was available I, for use. I believe it was actually behind, it was still in the cab behind the seats. So it wasn't in the bed of the truck. It was behind, still in the cab of the truck. The was there truck. evidence the bed of the truck was empty? I don't know. I don't know uh, that the record reflects that. Um, so in, uh, uh, the last thing is I'll point out with regard to the, the Leonard case that's been referenced here, State versus Leonard. Although Mr. Leonard's case was circumstantially presented as far as actions and sights and sounds, what we get here is, is the same duplicity, uh, the same circumstantial evidence, but this time it's through duplicity through Mr. Thomas's words to the police during this traffic stop. Um, and, and the nonsensical, the implausible explanation lead to the conclusion that there was sufficient evidence, a reasonable fact finder could have found that Mr. Thomas was in complete, acting in complicity with Mr. Berletic. Um, judge, you point out, Judge Carr did that, uh, Mr. Thomas did testify. And, and ultimately, it dramatically undermined his credibility and it gave context to what likely happened that night um, uh, of the break-in based on reasonable inferences. If Mr. Thomas, if what Mr. Thomas, is, Mr. Thomas testified to is true and accurate, then he could have told the police that very night what he testified to in court. He didn't even have to go to the police and say, I got caught up unwittingly in this. The police came to him within 10 minutes of the incident occurring. The traffic stop, by the way, Judge Teodosio, was based on 
uh, the truck meeting the description of a truck that had suspiciously been pulling into driveways on Red Hill and, and, and then turning its lights off. Um, what, what Mr. Thomas does is omit the inculpatory facts. He answers the questions that he is able to positively based on now knowing the, what the police knew, such as a car pulling into, uh, a truck pulling into driveways on Red Hill, and, um, and also about the tools. The, the, the fact of the matter is that if you really, you just follow the money. Mr. Burlett, uh, Mr. Thomas had been looking to get money all day, according to his testimony. He called multiple times to Laura, who he'd met once. Um, and this is really, the, Laura never comes up during the traffic stop until the, the officers prompt him. So now Laura comes up. He could have told police that that very night. Uh, he goes to Laura's house. So magically now everything starts at Laura, goes back to Laura and starts at Laura's house again with Mr. Berletic there. So now Mr. Thomas is putting himself with Mr. Berletic at the very start of the evening here. And Mr. Berletic has a plan to make money. That's what actually happened here. Mr. Berletic has a plan to make money. He goes, uh, Mr. Thomas does, goes to meet up with Mr. Berletic and they're going to go steal items, even if it means breaking into uh, a shed in this case. Thomas is wearing overalls, again, coveralls, at 11 o'clock at night, goes to the house of a woman he barely knows to pick up some guy he barely knows. Um, and they see this shed as they're driving, um, Westbound on Tower, Mr. Berletic gets dropped off. Mr. Thomas swings around on Red Hill to to go pick up uh, Mr. Berletic after he, he and that's why he's got to pull into these driveways because he's trying to kill time. They're communicating by cell phones by Mr. Thomas's own testimony. His cell phone was working just fine, even though police didn't think so at the time of the traffic stop. It was working just fine according to Mr. Thomas's testimony. The, the footprints also never leave the area of Washington and Tower. There's no footprints in the Red Hill uh, neighborhood, according to police. They went and checked. There was one set, and it looked like a guy that went and took his garbage out and maybe let his dog out, I think. was. was can, can I stop you for a second? Uh, Absolutely. You, you said that the two, two men were communicating by cell phone. And you also said the cell phone was operable, even though the officers did. Now, I, under, I understand there was a dispute as to whether or not the cell phone was operable, but was there actual evidence that the two had made telephonic uh, contact during this time that the shed was being broken into? Not actual evidence, Judge, but I think circumstantially we can infer okay. that Mr. Thomas is, is communicating with him by his phone. I mean, that's... Just because he had a phone? Yes. Okay. So, Mr. Thomas. And with that, Mr. Murphy, if you want to just uh, do a summary statement, your time's up. Sure. He doesn't contradict the state's evidence at all. There's um, no calls reporting trucks waiting on Red Hill. He can't coherently why he's wait explain why he's waiting a couple houses away. He never unprompted says that he went to Laura's house, Mr. Thomas does, and the footprints are only in the neighborhood. The only testimony that Mr. Thomas can give um, doesn't implicate himself uh, and, and just is, is not credible. Uh, and that's why the conviction here was not against the manifest weight. We'd ask that you uh, overrule both assignments of error and affirm the judgment of the uh, trial court and, and the convictions. Okay, thank you. Ms. Murphy, you've got four minutes. Yes, thank you, Your Honors. Um, I'll be honest with you, if this, if this case um, is upheld, I think it's a very dangerous precedent, um, mainly because, um, again, in the Leonard case, and um, there's a talk about a case, um, I can't think of the name here, it starts with an R, in which a mother um, brought her son to a, I think it was a Best Buy, uh, and, and the son gets in the vehicle afterwards, he throws the Xbox in the back and he says, take off, um, you know, we're, you know, uh, I stole this Xbox or, or whatever it was. 
Um, and the state argued in the Leonard case that that's what moms do, that moms um, take their sons to get video games at the store. And there's no way that she would have known um, that this would have uh, happened about um, you know him stealing the video game. And what we know in this case is that um, one, it was poor police work. Um, the police, you know, didn't link the tools um, and, and didn't um, ask the proper questions. And two, that the prosecution just didn't present enough evidence. Um, all of this evidence that's missing, it's, it's only circumstantial because, you know, the homeowner didn't testify. Um, the police didn't gather the proper evidence. And um, what we know about construction workers, and I'll point out transcript page 126, where there's talk about the tools and how um, Mr. Thomas has his, his entire life that his dad taught him how to fix cars and that he's always carried around tools in order to do that. And what we know about mechanics and construction workers are, um, you know, that they do carry those tools around. I can tell you my, you know, my, my uh, brother's in construction, he has no criminal record and he carries an entire, um, you know, an entire uh, van of tools around. And what we also know about construction workers is a lot of those workers don't have licenses and they don't have cars and that they're, kind of, they're constantly picking up other individuals to carry them around. I think this is a dangerous precedent to say because you have tools in your vehicle and maybe um, equipment that um, you know, you have knowledge that this that this other individual that you're carrying around um, had done cr a criminal act. What we know is that Mr. Braylick has, a, you know, he's a career criminal. He has a lifelong history of crime, and um, that Mr. Thomas has never been convicted of of any um, crime prior to this. Um, you know, this again is uh, it's entirely circumstantial, and it didn't need to be. Um, Counsel, what about the inconsistent statements? Just gonna answer. Yes, <laughs> inconsistent statements I want to address because that's something that, um, and, and I point out that the judge um, makes a point of as well in his decision. And again, I, what I'm, I, I'm conceding to you that maybe that's enough for probable cause. But what we need to look at is the testimony at trial, and um, the testimony at trial is clear that that um, you know he didn't he didn't know. And again, I, I don't know that it was inconsistent. And when you look at the transcripts. Um, it was, there was confusion, yes, um, because my client didn't know why he was being stopped, why he was being pulled over. Um, again, um, poor, poor presentation on the state and not getting those phone records. Do we know that they were communicating? No, that's something that they can always get a transcript of. They can always try to get those records. Um, you know, there was, you know, they had asked him, is your cell phone working or not? And there was, you know, talk along those lines. It was just confusion. And again, um, more so on the police's part and not asking the proper questions. Um, I would also point out that, you know, I, I don't just point to um, Mr. Thomas's statements in uh, my statement of facts. Uh, the police testified that, um, that Mr. Thomas denied any Im involvement or knowledge in Mr. Braylick's criminal um, activity. That's transcript uh, page 69, that's Patrolman Height that testified to that. Um, Patrolman Height transcript page 64, he testified that there was various items in the car and none of them were linked to the shed. Um, transcript page 59, again, Patrolman Height testified that Braylick was a career criminal, but that Thomas had um, no criminal history. And again, these are all things that we can look at just as much as um, having a cell phone. I, I just, um, you know, the proof here is beyond a reasonable doubt. And using, um, you know, the, the statements of um, Mr. Thomas, the confusion that happened at the traffic stop um, against him at trial in contradictory testimony, that basically eliminates his entire testimony. And that's what we have here. What we have here is a transcript of what he said at trial. Um, and, you know, again, I just, you know, regardless of all of that confusion, there's just not enough there. Um, you know, there's no actual evidence that Mr. Um, Thomas knew about any, any kind of criminal activity that was to take place. Um, again, there's no testimony that there's sound, there's no testimony that there was tools, and the state could have easily presented the homeowner to testify to that effect, and they didn't. Um, so again, that needs to be used, again, in the light most favorable to them, um, the fact that they didn't present that, and they didn't do their job in proving beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and you know, again, I, I, I just think this is drastically different than the Leonard case. It's drastically different than the um, rat, rat of a, which the mother brought the, the son. In that case... Oh, hang on. Well, 
I keep thinking you're going to wrap it up and you haven't. I'm sorry. Way I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm out of time. So what I would ask is that um, you overturn this conviction um, and um, uh, that's what that's what we ask. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you both for your arguments. We will take the matter under advisement, issue our written decision in due course. We'll be mailed to both sides as well as posted on our website and on that of the Supreme Court. Everybody have a good day.